Hey guys, last video I talked about the design process, but I didn't really talk about machining the new ballast scissors. In this video, I want to show some things I've learned and improvements I've made. I've started facing the tops of my pallets. Even when you aren't using the top as a reference surface, I think it makes things feel more predictable. I couldn't decide which parts in operation to put on a pallet. Eventually I had to do something, so I made a pallet with both ops for the handles, but I left space for other options. I wanted to make each handle in two ops instead of three. All of my titanium parts take three operations, basically because I wanted them to look cool and I wanted to use form tools. The point of aluminum ballast scissors is either to make faster tests or to make a less expensive product. Less tools helps with that. What helps even more is less operations. Simplifying the shapes makes that easier. My parts are still fairly thin though. I've been using the smallest sized pit bull clamp. I wanted to switch to half inch clamps because I didn't like using the small screws. You can't torque them much without damaging the head or the threads. I didn't originally use the bigger clamps because Mighty Bite recommends holding onto 100 thou, but with this I'll be only holding onto 70. I was nervous, but the clamps seemed to have plenty of holding power. I also decided to try using a carbide boring tool. Plunging the counter bore is much faster than milling it. I'm using air here so you can see better, but I use liquid coolant most of the time. In the second op, I can hold on to 95 thou. This setup worked great, so later I made the whole pallet for handles. It really only had three issues. One. I keep making fixtures where it's hard to pull the part out when it's done. I cut away some areas to make the parts less stuck and easier to grab. Two, in my last video, I talked about how the handles are no longer four of the same part. I once accidentally put the wrong op one part in op two, so I messed up a handle. To make this less likely to happen, I added a circle on the fixture and on the part, indicating which handle goes where. It'd be even better if I designed it so that I physically couldn't put the wrong part in the wrong spot, but this'll have to do for now. Lastly, clamping the sides leaves small marks. There are many ways I can fix this, but I'm ignoring it during these first tests. The spacer fixture was very similar. The benefit of putting both ops on a pallet is most clear on this part. I know I'm not going to be making any big changes in the design of this part, so I can just run both ops. Then when I run out of stock, I just leave the half finished parts for later. When I get more stock, I can just clamp them in, press go, and remove the finished parts I started last time. I tried something a little different for the buttons. I didn't want to keep using two screws per part, so I tried using machinable clamps for op 2. Now two screws gets me four parts. This worked really well, but I'm trading off turning less screws for using more material. Making buttons out of a big sheet might be worth trying. I'm the least happy with my new blade fixtures. I have three out of the five blade operations on this pallet. Now one of my blades has a countersink, so I'm using the same tool to spot drill all the holes, as well as make the hole with the countersink. Getting more use out of one tool means less tool changes. Because I put three operations on one pallet, each tool isn't doing that much work. I have to do a tool change to drill a single hole. If I had put eight of the same type of blade and operation together, I'd be drilling eight holes. In the first op, I'm using a clamp I made to hold down the steel. This was to put less bend in them than pit bolts would. Later, I added a screw to make the blades even flatter. I decided to standardize all my fixtures to 832 threads but I didn't think about how I'd end up using different drivers. I think I should just add another tab to the blade so I can just use two matching screws. I don't really like the shoulder screws either though. For some reason the precision shoulder screw has an allen key size of 330 seconds. So just like my old small clamps, I have to be careful not to ruin the screw head. I got braver here and I cut out the shape of the blade with two slotting passes. I didn't have a lot of room for an adaptive tool path, and I didn't want to spend the time either. This seemed too hot to do without flood coolant. The bigger problem is the material that's left over. These pieces can get caught and end up causing a crash. 
which eventually did break an end mill once. I don't have to worry about this at all with the laser cut links. I'm using A2 steel for now. I chose it because it's dimensionally accurate and I didn't want to use my fancier steel yet. Op 3, I machine the magnet pocket and I deburr the outside. I might be able to skip this if I add another tap to the blades. Here's where I would heat treat the part, but I skipped it to focus on machining instead. I wish I went ahead and made each op its own pallet. Op 1 is okay, but now to change op 2 or 3, I'll have to scrap this whole pallet. Op 4 and 5 are on a simple pallet with holes. Op 4 is machining the bevel. Lastly, Op 5, I use an angle clamp I made to hold the blade down while I mill away the tab. I had issues with vibration here. I think I should make a bigger clamp that holds further down the blade. I assembled the bell scissors with some extra pins I had. I tapped the pins using a little block I made. They definitely didn't come out perfect. The handles could smack together, the holes in the blades were tight, and the holes in the handles were loose. Yet, it felt like good progress. I made another pair, hoping to fix the issues. For some reason, this one was actually much harder to get together. And this time, the handles seemed slightly too spread apart. I expanded my fixtures to make more parts at once. So I tried a third time. These were the best so far, but it still felt not quite right. Every pair I made, I think it'll answer all the questions I have, but I just end up with even more. I realized I was making parts even faster than I thought I could though. I felt like I could experiment more. I made lots of different pin ideas I had. I just wanted to get a feel for what features and what parts had what effect. For example, I made a pin with no chamfers on the lobes, which did lead to worse behavior, but not as much as expected, which is pretty much the results for all the tests I tried. Now I was starting to answer more questions than I was creating. My design seemed fine, I just needed to make things more reliable. After making 8 scissors, I was pretty sure I found the problem. My pins had a slight taper to them. Maybe a thou. This problem was made worse because I could only test one end of the pins when making my parts. Which means half my parts are loose and half are tight. To help with measuring, I milled an oversized pin shape in my fixtures so I could push the pins all the way through. But it'd be better if the pins didn't have any taper at all. I thought the taper was from end mill deflection. I switched to a necked end mill with shorter flutes. More carbide means more rigidity. And by taking smaller cuts, I also reduced the cutting forces. I still ended up having to take a spring pass, but I was able to remove the taper. This was a huge improvement to the button. I made enough of these improved pins for all eight ballast scissors, and I swapped them all out. But this time, I tried to record the size of the holes and pins. Some buttons felt better than others. I had been trying to make holes a thou bigger than the pins. I was surprised to see that the best buttons seemed to have a closer to two thou gap. I also wanted to solve the issue with the handles either touching or being too far apart. It's tricky to measure these neck areas where the Zen pins touch. The real reason I got this ID mic was to try setting it backwards to measure the neck of my blades. Unfortunately, you can't use the ratchet this way, so I just have to try to keep a light grip on the smooth end and let my fingers slide to get a consistent reading. I found that I needed to add a spring pass to the neck to get an accurate size. This makes sense. The tight area is almost the same size as the end mill, which means there's a lot of cutter engagement and therefore deflection, similar to the pins. This seems obvious, but for a while I couldn't tell if it was a measuring problem or a machining problem. So many things may seem obvious, but they're only obvious when you're looking at the right variable. One of the issues the button can have is if you push one side more than the other, it can parallelogram and get stuck. The pins need to have some freedom to move relative to the button in order for the scissors to be able to open and close. But I designed the pins and button so that they couldn't move up and down because of the screws holding them in place. I tried to design, make, and measure parts better and better, but I still sometimes end up with way more play than I expected. 
After assembling these scissors 16 times, I found the problem. My screws can't tighten all the way down because they're not perfectly threaded to the head. It's tough to see on these little 256 screws. I added a bigger chamfer to the pins and bam, another huge improvement in reliability. Everyone watching is probably like, duh. But here's the thing, I knew that screws aren't threaded all the way to the head, but I just assumed a modest sized chamfer would solve the problem and I never thought about it again. I was focused on so many other variables in my design or worried about completely different problems that I missed something so simple. I think sometimes you just have to try things a bunch of times for your brain to notice how you're screwing up. So increasing the rate I make scissors has made that process a lot faster. Thanks for watching. See ya.